Good morning, Emmanuel Church. It is great to be here with you this morning. Uh, My name is James Connolly. I'm the Youth and Outreach Pastor, and uh, I welcome you. If you're visiting with us for the first time this morning, I just want to give a special welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. I also want to take a moment to welcome our online friends who are viewing via live stream. We are also glad that you're with us this morning as well. Uh, I have a few church updates uh, that I like to give, or really two things I want to really point out and mention to you. The first is the Fisherman's Banquet. Fisherman's Banquet is going to be August 20th. Uh, You can register for that right now online via our church website or through the Church Center app. And we encourage you to do that. That way you can make sure that you get your tickets uh, for that awesome day. It is going to be great. If you are interested in any way in volunteering for that event, whether it's set up, tear down, or uh, various other ways, or even wanting to donate dessert, I want to encourage you to go down to the foyer when you leave today. And Dave and Janice Michaels will be down there with a sign-up sheet. So if you're wanting to volunteer in any way for that or donate desserts, down in the foyer will be a sign-up sheet for you to be able to uh, sign up for that, and we want to encourage you to do that because they will be in need for that. There's going to be, uh, we're hoping to have over 100, maybe 150 people for that, uh, and this is the first year for this event, and so we're super excited for what God's going to do. I also want to mention to you, coming up on August 14th is going to be our Great Commission Sunday. And so we're very excited. This is a very special Sunday morning where our emphasis is on missions. Uh, As you know, we are the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Missions is literally our middle name. And so we value God's mission in sending people to the darkest places in this world to preach the gospel so that everyone gets a chance to hear God's good news. And so I actually have a video we want to show you this morning just about that very thing. where relationship is key. Spending time with people is key. Taking the time to sit and build relationship is key. We'll just sit with them and almost every conversation at some point something will come up where we can say, look, that reminds me of the story from the Holy Book. Uh, Can I tell you the story? The response is, yeah, of course. I'd love to hear that story. You have to be present. You have to have time before that kind of trust develops. The work is slow. It takes time. When we say they are like family, it's because that's how it really feels. Amen. And what I love about that video is it points out the importance of relationships. And taking time to build relationships to share the gospel message with people. And the only way that those relationships take place is having churches like us being willing to support. Being willing to take money that that we have put together and send it over there for workers to be able to go. And we do that by giving to the Great Commission Fund. And the Great Commission Fund is what helps our international workers to be able to do what they need to do and to build those relationships and share the gospel. And so on the 14th, we're letting you know ahead of time, because this is an all-church initiative. We're saying children, youth, and adults, we're encouraging you to be able to prepare on that Sunday to give an offering to be able to go to the Great Commission Fund to help support missions. We're very blessed. That day, we're going to have two international workers with us, Ross and Elaine Moore. They're uh, international workers to a creative access country. Country, and we're excited to have them. It's been two years since we've had them here. They were here two years ago um, for missions conference, and it was such a blessing having them, and it's going to be great to have them again. And so the whole day is just going to be very special, getting a chance to have that missions focus. So we encourage you, start praying, God, what do you want me to give to the mission field to be able to go and to be able to be used to build relationships and share the gospel? Will you pray with me towards this end? Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for your goodness. We're thankful, Lord, that your desire is not for you to do the work and us to just sit back and watch. But, Lord, you desire to use us, to invite us to be a part. And so, Lord, we want to seek your face and say, yes, 
We want to be involved in that. And so, Lord, I pray. I pray that many churches give all that is needed, that you provide what is needed for these missionaries to build those relationships. And Jesus, we, we just want to praise you. We praise you for wanting us to be involved. We praise you for your goodness. And right now, Jesus, we want to have an attitude of worship. And so, Lord, we come before the throne now saying, have your way. Touch our hearts, Lord. Reach deep within and do a work within us so that we can be in line with your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with us this morning as we worship the Lord together. <clears throat> Psalm 25 says, May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. Shouting for joy for our victory. We know who has won the battle, don't we? Jesus Christ, he went to the cross, he died for us, and he rose again, and he conquered death. And I think that is something for us to celebrate this morning of our victory in Jesus Christ. The second part of this, this uh, verse says, to lift up our banners in the name of our Lord God. Lifting up a banner. And when you think back in biblical times, a banner, when an army was going into battle and they won, they would lift up a banner to say, we have won, we declare our victory. They also would lift up a banner to say, this is our allegiance to our king. This morning, we may not have a banner to raise, but we can declare our victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can also raise a banner of praise that says that our victory is in Christ. So this morning, let's come before and let's lift up a banner of praise with whether it's our voices, whether it's our hands, and let's praise the name of Jesus. Let's do that together this morning.
King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. King forever, forevermore, you are victorious. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same. Your faithfulness. I'm holding on the God of Mary, whose faith rests upon the Lord. I know with you all things are. declare to him that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You heard your children then, you hear your children now, you are the same God, you are the same God, you answer prayers back then, and you will answer now, you are the same
We've just sung about our God. He is our firm foundation. He's our rock. And he is faithful. In the last song, we just sung, Oh God, oh God, I need you. You are the rock of all ages, of all times. He's the one that we can go to. He's the one that we can cling to. He is steady. He is never changing. No matter what we're going through, good or bad, he's the one that we can cling to at all times. We've created some space here just to have some time with the Lord. So this time you can do what the Lord leads. If you wanna pray during this time, if you wanna be silent, if you want to sing. But I want to encourage you just to be with him. We're going to have some scripture read. We're going to sing um, a mixture of a song. Some of it may be new to you. Some of it may be very familiar with you. A part of we're going to sing is an old hymn, Rock of Ages. Just a little clip of that. But let's come before the Lord and be in his presence.
is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. in the Lord forever for the Lord the Lord himself is the rock eternal
as praise back to you. We declare this as a truth that we can stand on that is rock solid, that you, Jesus, are enough in every circumstance for all of the days of our life. No matter how we are feeling, you are enough and everything that we have is in you. Lord, would you write that on our hearts in ink that will never come off? And would we be reminded of that this week, this month, this year, that you are enough and all of our needs are met by you? We give you praise. We give you all of our thanksgiving. And Lord, I pray that this morning, as we sit here and soak in your presence that is in this place, we would know you deeper and you would change something in our hearts that we would look and be more like you, ever being transformed into the image of Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Lord, if we feel distant from you or we do not know you today, would you reveal yourself? Would you come and pursue us? And would you unlock this morning the riches of who you are for each of us in this place? You are our Lord, you are our savior, and we love you. Thank you, Lord. We pray all of this in your name, Jesus, amen. Well, this morning, before we dismiss the kids, I want to bring up our newest staff member, Brett Warner. Come on up, Brett. Woo! Give him a warm welcome. Come on. Come on. More. Come on. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is Brett's first time up here uh, with us as a church family. Uh, he interviewed back in April? 
yes. uh, came up here, but it was so preliminary at that point, we didn't have him come up on, on the platform. Well, he moved last weekend, and he literally had just moved in. So we didn't say, Brett, come on up here and share. We just said, okay, you can hang, just be regular. But he starts officially tomorrow. And so uh, we want to make sure that we have him up here and, and you get to know him a little bit and hear a little bit from his heart uh, as he's joining us on our team. Now, uh, just so you know, uh, what is Brett going to be doing? He is going to be kicking off with us tomorrow a two-year, what's called ALME. There's always code words for these things and, you know, uh, to make it shorter and more memorable. Alliance Licensed Ministry Experience. So I'm glad they call it ALME, not the full thing. Uh, so he's going to do two years with us to be preparing, training, getting experience toward uh, serving with the Alliance uh, overseas. That's kind of the intention of, of his goal and his calling. And so we're going to hear a little bit about that this morning. And uh, also with his uh, credentials that he has with the Alliance and as he's pursuing his ordination with the Alliance, he will be known here with us as Pastor Brett. So you can call him that as well. And he'll be doing the roles uh, as Anna is finishing hers in two weeks. They overlap for two weeks. And she's going to be the awesome trainer to give him all the knowledge she's acquired in two years and download it to him in two weeks. So you can be praying for that transition. Anna is going to be officially uh, finishing off on our staff on April 15th. And we will be honoring Anna as that comes closer. Um, but we're welcoming Brett here today. And he'll be working with the English ministries and college ministries and some things in worship ministries and all kinds of other ministries because that's what you do when you're starting out. You get your hands in a lot of different things. So, Brett, let me give this to you. Um, this is your first time in front. Tell us a little bit about yourself, yeah. your life and your situation in life, and maybe you're dating somebody or, you know, okay. Yeah, so first of all, thank you guys so much for how you've already welcomed me. Like just being here within the last week and being here at church on Sunday, I felt so blessed by how you guys have connected with me and intentionally like come up and spoken and the gift cards, all of it has been a huge blessing. So thank you. Um, but yes, my name is Brett, um, as he said. Uh, I'm originally from Charlotte, North Carolina. So my parents and my older brother still live there. So I'm the first to kind of truly leave the nest and come up, move to the north. I'm the crazy one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I recently graduated from Tacoma Falls College. Pause um, there for a second. Let's, go. let's hear yeah. it. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Yes, so I graduated in spring with a bachelor's in cross-cultural adult education and a minor in teaching English to speakers of other languages. So um, it was a great place for training and growing, and I met my girlfriend there, so I am dating someone. Um, we've been dating for 11 months. She actually lives about an hour and a half towards Philly from here, um, so she's planning on joining us on Sundays and being a part as much as she can in ministry um, she actually just came back from West Africa serving where um, Ross and Elaine are serving, who will be here in a few weeks. Um, Small and, world in the alliance, right? Yeah, Lots of yeah. overlap, yeah. Um, but yeah, so she'll be here. Um, super excited for that. She'll probably be here in the next few Sundays. All right, her name so. is, did you say? Her Aubrey. Aubrey. So remember the name Aubrey, and she'll be... Uh, joining in with ministry and just being kind of part of our church on, on Sundays. Uh, she will have to be home during the week, but, uh, but here with us on the weekends. Um, real quick, you, you grew up in Charlotte. Yes. You went to Tacoma Falls College, which is in Georgia. Yes. Would you say the word y'all? Is that like, does that roll off your tongue? Yes. Yeah. I've been struggling with that already. I'm like, <laughs> I keep saying it and I don't think people look at me weird, but they might feel it. You know? All right. Are you okay if he uses the word y'all with y'all? Okay. okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Wow. So you now have permission to use <laughs> it. Home. Yeah. yeah. Um, if if y'all want to say the word y'all, you can say it, and it's okay. We can bring yeah. the South to I'll, the North. I'll teach we can you. This kind is of make, cultural training. We can make you feel at home. Yeah. But technically, if you're in Pennsylvania, if you don't want to make people look at you weird, you would say you all. No, not yins. Who said that? <laughs> yeah. Western Pennsylvania folks. Okay, all right. Do you know what that even means? No. He's never heard of that before. <laughs> All right, if you're in western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh area, you'd say yins. Okay. And that's the same equivalent as y'all, but just with a very small minority of people who live in a weird part of the okay. state. That's, that's all you but need to know. But they're here. So. <laughs> Not here in Mechanicsburg. All right. Um, okay, so uh, tell us a little bit about your calling. You're, you intend to serve with the Alliance in, yeah. in a couple of years. Uh, how did God bring you to this place that you want to you wanna serve him overseas and connect with people interculturally, bring the good news of Christ? Yeah, so... Um, 
Going back to when I came to faith, I was a freshman in high school, um, and pretty early on, like, when I met Jesus, I just wanted to invite everyone I could think of into that life and the um, joy and love and fullness that I had found in Christ. Um, so pretty early on, I knew that no matter what I was doing, it would involve bringing people into what I had found. Um, but as I, like, continued reading scripture, every time I would come across passages that talked about the nations or people who have never heard or don't know him, um, or everyone, people from all nations being represented in the throne room, um, there was just like a burning in my heart every time I would read one of those. So that's kind of how this developed. And over time, I kept finding that this was a desire. And as I learned more about the need in the nations for gospel access um, and how many places in the world still had no access to know who Jesus was, it just grew and grew. And it kind of culminated at a point where I was just asking God, like, okay, is this just my desire? Is this something you have for me? Or is, are those two things related? Um, and I was praying one night and opened the word and started reading in Jeremiah 1. And that first passage, God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I pointed you to be a prophet to the nations. And the Lord was, like, speaking that directly to me as I read it. And I was like, okay, well, now what do I do? So I went to TFC <laughs> um, and... Got a lot of training there because I had no clue what that looked like moving on from that point. Um, got a lot of really great training there. That was where I first started rubbing shoulders with the Alliance. I actually grew up in a Southern Baptist church um, and so didn't know about the Alliance until I came to TFC. So met people, heard a lot of international workers, their stories and the heart for bringing all of Jesus to all the world. Um, and my heart aligned with that and connected with that immediately. So that's kind of led me to this step of faith and coming here in the next part of that journey and wherever God takes me in the future. So very thankful to be here now. Yeah. So we, y'all, are not the, well, you're not the first representation of Christ to him at all because he's had a church family for years and years. But we are the first representation, at least as a church home, of an alliance yes. church for Brett. So, you know, you got to put your best foot forward. <laughs> for him on that. And uh, no, we're just glad to have you here with us, Brett. One last question. Uh, you're here with us for two years. Yeah. What would make these two years successful other than just like making it through, you know, without, <laughs> without destroying anything, whatever. Um, and, and, you know, getting your ordination and things like that. What in your, in your heart would make this a good two years? Yeah. Well, definitely I want to see people come into the kingdom of God. Um, I want to see people encounter Jesus and walk deeper with him, uh, but I know that that's not my fruit to bear. So I think for me, just being faithful in speaking the word and, and being obedient when the Lord leads me to do something, um, and also finding family here. Um, that is something that I've been praying for, and um, I'm so thankful that the Alliance has this process to get plugged into a family, a church family. So um, I'm excited to be family with you guys, and wherever the Lord sends me after this, leaving with family. So. Yeah, and that's happened. I mean, it's happened with Colin and Anna. Uh, it's happened with, you know, others that have been sent from our church. And we hope one day to be able to send you guys. We hope to be able to send you guys. And we need to be a, a church home that uh, invests, uh, pours into, loves, develops others, and then sends them to where God has them to go. So that's, that's our heart in all of this. Um, we're going to commission you. We're going to pray for you, and, and, and we are going to do that. Uh, I'm gonna, not, I can't have all of you come up here and, and lay hands on Brett because that would just be too many, but um, all of those who are staff, uh, elders, uh, spouses, if you're part of the English ministry, if you're part of the networking with Brett's ministry, future ministry, I'd like you to come up. Uh, Brett, why don't we have you come right down here, and uh, we're just going to pray over you, so don't be bashful. Come, and uh, let's gather around, and then... If you aren't able to be up here physically, just join your hearts in, in prayer together with us uh, as we pray for Brett and set him apart for this ministry. If any more want to come, we can get more. If Zach and Jen, you guys are international workers. Come on, why don't you guys come up? Others, and anybody else who wants to come join us. Lord Jesus, we come together uh, as a church family today, called by you. We're all called to you, Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our Master. And we present your servant before you today, Brett. Lord Jesus, 
we thank you for bringing him to us. We saw you clearly lead him to us in this process up until now. Um, we're so grateful for that. We're grateful for your provisions, your confirmations, and all these, these things you've done. And here on this day, the, the last official day before he starts tomorrow, we want to ask you, Lord, Holy Spirit, will you come upon Brett? Will you fill him, his heart, his mind, his soul? Lord Jesus, we ask that supernaturally you will use him to connect people together. You will use him to proclaim your word. You will use him to pull teams of people together. You will use him to bring the light into dark places. You will use him to bring others to Christ. We pray, Lord, you will use him to encourage us and teach us as a church. And we pray, Lord, that these two years would be formational years, transformational years for him and for Aubrey. We pray, oh Lord, that you will prepare them for the work that you have for them. Lord Jesus, we pray that we as a church will be faithful to support him and to love him, to pray for him. Uh, as he said, to become family. So, Lord, even right now, give us ways that we can connect with Brett, um, whether it be taking him out for dinner, whether that be taking him out for coffee, writing an email, just making sure we pray for him daily or weekly on our, our prayer lists. And, and uh, Lord, we look to you for great things for your kingdom. Do this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Kids, uh, you can be dismissed age five through fifth grade to your classes. Oh no, the pastor's coming with a table and his red bag again. But this week, it's not Coke. I thought I'd go with something a little healthier this week, and it is... Lettuce. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so are there any salad fans out there? Any, anybody like salad? Okay, good. And it, it's probably not so much the lettuce, it's what you put on the salad that you really like. So, you know, go ahead and shout out some ingredients you like on your salad. Let's hear it. Bacon. Guacamole. Cheese. Eggs. Croutons. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cucumbers. Ooh, yeah. Meat. Chicken. Steak. Yeah. Uh, what dressings? Ranch. Ranch, Italian, Thousand Island. Okay, we got all that. Okay, that's cool. I also brought with me a trusty little tool that I need that I will not be leaving up here after the service for anybody else to touch. But um, okay, so why in the world do I have this up here today? Well, in the scripture we're going to look at several times, it uses the word lettuce. But it says, let us draw near to God. Let us hold on to the hope that we have. Let us encourage one another. Those are the ways it uses it. There's actually four times, five times, depending on your translation, it says those words. And I thought, man, we gotta, we gotta make sure that we keep our street going and have some, some food up here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this. I'm gonna use, depending on your translation, it's, it's different times. I'm gonna have four times that we go through the word lettuce. So I'm gonna cut this right now into some wedges. See how nice lettuce, wait, wait, let me try it this week and see if it works. Ah. No, no, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay, that's what we did with Coke last week. So we got wedge number one, we got wedge number two, we got wedge number three, and we've got wedge number four. I'm not nearly as excited about this as I was last week. Man, I'm sorry, so sorry. And, and uh, Last week, I, I thought for sure the Coke and the Pepsi were gonna be gone, stolen you know, by somebody as I was out talking to people, but they were all here when I got back. So I was excited. I have a feeling this lettuce will be here because um, I don't think anyone's going to take that. All right. Well, we're going to be in Hebrews 10 today, but this comes on the heels of our last several chapters where we've talked about the amazing salvation we have in Christ. We've talked about in Hebrews 8, 9, 10, uh, the beginning of 10 last week as, as we looked at the old covenant versus the new covenant. We've looked at what we now have in Christ, and, and the old covenant laid out so many good truths. It was, the old covenant was not bad. 
It was good because it was God's word. It was God revealed to them. It revealed how God is holy, revealed how God is awesome, how he is one who has a, a law for us. And we need to, to know what's right and what's wrong. And, and, and we need to know what kinds of things are needed to make up for our sinfulness, which is a sacrifice. But we also saw that the old covenant is insufficient. While it's good, it's insufficient. The old covenant cannot make us holy. The law only points out what we do wrong. It can't actually make us right. The sacrifices that were offered could never take away the sins of the people and truly cleanse their consciences. We needed a new sacrifice, a good sacrifice, a sufficient sacrifice, which would be in Christ. And so we saw all those comparisons as we looked at it all. Man, I've got lettuce in my mouth. <laughs> One second. It doesn't go down like Coke does. But the one event that probably encapsulates the old covenant the best is a certain sacrifice that happened once a year. It was called what? The Day of Atonement. I want to just unpack that for you real quickly before we get into the, pa the passage because it, it sets the context for what we're about to read. The Day of Atonement happened once a year. It's when God commanded for the high priest who was on duty that year to to uh, come before the Lord. The high priest would have certain washings he would do and changing his garments into these special garments that God had, had provided a, of a linen ephod and all these different things, a special robe, a special turban. He would make sacrifices for himself and for his family because of his own sin guilt. Then he would offer a sacrifice on behalf of the nation of Israel. And then he would go into the tabernacle or go into the temple. What's the difference between the tabernacle and the temple? Well, the tabernacle is, is the exact same format as the temple, the same layout. It's just that the tabernacle was the mobile version for the first couple of hundred years. They would set it up and they would be able to move. Then they would set it up and be able to move. Uh, it was made with, with more of a tent-like material where the temple was when they finally had Jerusalem as the, their home, as their capital. And then King Solomon was able to build the temple out of stone. Same exact thing. So when you hear that, that, uh, that those things talked about, and when we see a diagram here in a moment, we're going to look at the temple's diagram, or the tabernacle's diagram rather than the temple, but it's the same thing. So the priest would go into the, the tabernacle. Let's go ahead and put the picture up here on the screen. This is what it looked like in terms of the, the layout of, of what God had commanded them to build. This is in the book of Exodus. God told Moses in 1400 BC how to make all this, and they had all these uh, artisans come together and do this uh, out of the nation of Israel. The outer part there, the, the fence that surrounded it, this, this wall, kept people out. You didn't just have people approaching the tabernacle willy-nilly. Just anybody could walk up any time. It was protected. It was guarded in a sense that the, the average person could not go there. In fact, Gentiles, non-Jews, couldn't even go inside of, of those walls. They had to stay outside and, and worship if they were worshipers of Yahweh. Women could go in up to a certain point. Men could go in a little bit further. But still, people had to stay back away from the, the structure of the tabernacle itself, only the priests could go into the tabernacle. By the way, the priests were serving as one tribe out of 12 in the nation of Israel. What tribe was it? The Levites. So there were 10 tribes. But think about how the numbers of how small that truly was. Even though it was thousands and thousands of people, the Levites, they were only a sliver of the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel was only a sliver of the population on earth. Only a very small number of people had access into that tabernacle. And, and the Levites were on a rotation that uh, twice a year they would serve with their family around the temple grounds. And normally they were doorkeepers and they, they were tending to other things around. But a couple of times in their lifetime, they actually got to go inside the temple and minister before the Lord there. I'm going to change the diagram here to go, go forward and kind of zoom into what it would have looked like inside of the tabernacle. And so this is kind of a replica, uh, but it gives you an idea. On the right-hand side of the picture you're looking at was the larger room. It was, it was called the holy place. And inside the holy place, the, the priests were allowed to go in there. They would minister there by tending to those lamps. They were always burning before the Lord. The incense that was always burning before the Lord, the, 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 bread, the bread of the presence that was there as an offering before the Lord. And, and they, would, they would do those things, and they would go in for the time that's needed, and then they would go out. But on the left side, there's a curtain dividing the holy place from the most holy place. 
It was a special place that nobody got to go into except the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. Inside of the most holy place is, is the Ark of the Covenant that God had told them to build all those years ago with Moses. And, and, and there on, above the Ark of the Covenant were two angels that were spread out over top. And God's presence would physically dwell there. God is omnipresent. He's, he's everywhere. But he would manifest his presence right there over top of the Ark of the Covenant. And it was over top of the part, of the, of the, the, the cover on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat where God would declare, this is where I will sit as I have, I'm a God of mercy to my people. The high priest could go in there once a year. As he's come, he's made all those, the sacrifices for himself, for his family. He's washed himself. He, he's gone with his certain garments. He would go to that curtain, that veil, and he would go behind that veil. And can you imagine what that would have felt like? To walk there, and you're walking into where the, the glory of God, the presence of God physically dwells. And the, the, the priest would have on a robe that had bells sewn into the bottom of it so you, the people could hear, the other priests who were on the other side waiting for him, could hear that he's still alive. Because if you went into the presence of God in an unholy way, he would be killed. And so the bells told him that he's still alive, he's still moving around, he's still doing the work that he's supposed to do. He had an, a rope tied around his ankle so that if he did die, no one would have to go in to retrieve him, they could pull him out. That's how serious, that's how holy this was. And, and he would bring blood from that sacrifice and he would sprinkle it on the, on the Ark of the Covenant. And in doing so, that was making the atonement, the covering for the sin of the people that year. Now, everyone still brought their sacrifices. They all brought their individual sacrifices. That was part of the, the, the worship that they did all year round. But that day, it was representative of the forgiveness of the sins of the people for the whole year, for the next year to come. And so it would be another year until he would go back into that place, the most holy place. Do you see how restrictive this is? Do you see how very few people have access to the presence of God? Very few people, only one priest, once a year, gets to go behind that curtain, gets to minister before the Lord, gets to have access to the Lord, gets to enjoy his presence and, and see his glory. One priest, once a year out of all the people on earth, there was a separation. It was amazing that God dwelt there in Israel, that he made his presence known. That was an act of grace and mercy itself, that he would even be with them. But it was also an act of mercy that he separated them away, because if we come before God's presence in an unholy way, we will not live. His judgment would come upon us, and that was the separation between God and people, and yet he was able to be at least that much there with them. That's the background. That's the understanding we have to have in order to understand how wonderful the new covenant is, to understand what we've been given in Christ. But God's heart is not that we would be separated. God's heart is that somehow we would be able to have access to him that all of us could have access, direct access to God. In fact, if you think back to creation, before sin entered the world, who lived in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve. And they walked with God in the cool of the day. There was no separation between them and God. And then sin happened. And everything was messed up from there forward. And, and now if we look at the end of time, if we look at heaven in Revelation chapter 21, it tells us that now we're going to be with God. There's going to be no more tears, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And it, it says this, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and they will be, he will be their God. There's a con together with, uh, togetherness with no separation there in heaven. But here on earth, the provision was made for us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to open the way that we could be together. That's always been God's heart, that we would be together. And now open your scripture to Hebrews chapter 10. We're gonna look at verses 19 through 25. This one section today that has this foundational understanding that gets to some very practical applications of let us. We'll get there in just a moment. 
But read with me, read along with me as I read 19, 20, and 21 initially. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, stop. (laughs) Did you hear that? Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, okay, I'll keep reading, by what? The blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let's stop there for just a moment before we get the rest of it. It's setting that stage. Do you hear it? The the, the sounds of the day of atonement, the, the, the restrictiveness of the temple and the tabernacle. It says, now since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. It's just changed from from one priest once a year to now all of us who are believers in Christ. We have access. And we don't come in kind of wondering, will he accept us? Will I be able to live if I'm in his presence? Have I done it all right? Have all the sacrifices been made properly? I don't know if I'll even get out of here alive. He says, no, we have confidence now to enter the most holy place. You and I have the same access even more than that priest did all those years ago under the old covenant. We have been given an incredible privilege now to enter the most holy place. How in the world can we presume to have that kind of confidence? How in the world can we have access to God like that? Well, it tells us that our confidence is not in ourselves. It it tells us that our confidence is in who? Jesus. We enter now by the blood of of Jesus, not sprinkled by some uh, animal sacrifice that paid somehow, you know, covers our sins. This, this is the blood of Jesus now who's given us this access by a new and living way. Well, that's a reference also to who? Jesus. He, he died as the sacrifice, but he rose again. He's alive. And through our relationship with him is how we have this access open for us through the curtain, which is his body. This is a beautiful picture. I love this description about Christ. The curtain, the the veil that that divided the holy place from the most holy place, that restrictive curtain that that protected us from from the, the wrath of God, from the holiness of God, has now been torn wide open. It says that Christ was that curtain, was that veil who was now, who is now opened for us. Do you remember what happened as Jesus died on the cross? What happened in the temple? curtain, the veil was torn in two. How? Top to bottom. Could a human being have climbed up to the top of that curtain and torn it down? No. This was God who ripped it open. As Christ was crucified for us, as he was sacrificed for us, as he was torn, the veil was torn. It is his body. It's a picture of that. In fact, I want to put a picture on the screen. There is a lot of action in this photo. Just take it in for a minute. This is an artist's rendition. See how the veil is torn from top to bottom in motion. Imagine the hands of God just ripping that open. And look at the reaction of the priests who were serving in in the temple there. In awe and amazement, what just happened? This this can't happen. God's presence can't be with us because we will all die. and, And this is not supposed to happen. This is what God showed us. And they're falling on their knees. They're falling on their faces in amazement. Little did they understand what was happening on the hill of Golgotha. Jesus, the one sacrifice needed for our sins, the one who's all sufficient, was tearing open the separation that now the presence of God can can be with the people and the people can be with the presence of God. We don't have to stay restricted and far off. We We have one who was sufficient to take away our sins, to make us holy as we looked at last week. Now we can be brought together. And from this understanding, we also get get one more uh, piece of information in verse 21. It says that we have a great high priest over the house of God. Who's that? Jesus. It had told us that in earlier chapters. So it just tells us the way that we have this is because of Jesus, because of Jesus, because of Jesus, because of Jesus. Do you get the message? It's all about Jesus, our connection with him, our relationship with him, our faith in him because of what he did for us. Because of all that, built upon that foundation, we now come to four key applications. The first wedge of let us. What does he tell us to do in the next verse? Let us draw near 
to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We'll stop there. There's more references to the Day of Atonement there about having our hearts sprinkled and our consciences are now cleansed because of that sprinkling. We have our bodies washed with pure water and that's kind of referencing how how the priests had to do those washings to symbolize their purity and, and holiness before the Lord. By the way, one of the things that happens to us when we become believers in Christ is that we are washed. Our sins are washed away. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He, he has washed us. He's cleansed us. In fact, in baptism, we just talked, covered this in our membership class today, one of the meanings with baptism is a washing. Uh, the other part is the, the death that we have uh, to our old self and now raised again to new life. We were, were buried with Christ and raised again. But baptism is one of those pictures when we see that. We're, we're reminding, oh yeah, this is what happened. We've been cleansed of our sin. By the way, if you have not followed the command of Christ to be baptized, if you place your faith in him and you have not yet been baptized to proclaim that salvation, come talk to us. We would be glad to schedule that. We're ready to do more baptisms. But it tells us this, uh, this kind of imagery of, of the Day of Atonement and how we have this now. But it says, let us draw near to God in full assurance of faith. This is his will for us. We're told to draw near. As I've been studying this this week, I've been struck by the amazing privilege that we have. The Old Testament saints, the Old Covenant saints could not draw near to God with full assurance of faith. They couldn't get close. They were never fully sure. But we have been given access right into the most holy place and we know we can have confidence to come to the Lord because of the sacrifice that was given to us in Christ. We've been cleansed. Our guilt is washed away. We can be with the Lord. What an amazing privilege that is. We can be with him anytime, anywhere. Not only is God omnipresent and we can never get away from his presence that way, but we also have his manifest dwelling presence that used to be there in the most holy place now with us. We don't have to fly, get on a plane, and go over to Jerusalem in order to meet with the Lord. We don't have to go and get a sacrifice for our sins in order to be able to approach the Lord. We don't have to come to another priest. We have direct access to the most holy place. And guess where he dwells? Now inside of us, in a manifest way, God's presence physically dwells inside of you and me. And he shows up. I love that I can meet with God anytime, anywhere. I wish I took more advantage of what we've been given in Christ. But in the morning when you get up and and you spend time with the Lord, just you and your Bible in prayer, you have the Lord with you. You have full access to God. Throughout the day as you go, you carry his presence wherever you go. If you're driving somewhere, you have God's presence with you. Just a couple weeks ago, we were driving down the road at 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, 85 miles an hour. And I was driving early in the morning, and the flow of traffic was just going. And so I was going with them, and all the family was asleep in the car as we're driving along. And I got some new AirPods, and I had them in. And I was listening to worship music, and I had... I didn't have my eyes closed. I had my eyes open. Sorry. I had, I had my hands like this as I'm, as I'm singing, trying not to sing out loud, kind of mouthing the words because they're all asleep. And, and I'm just pouring my heart out to God and surrendering like this. And I had my hands on the steering wheel, don't worry, kind of like this, my thumbs. And I was just, just, just pouring my heart out to the Lord, and he's there with me. We have his presence wherever we go. I got home. I was talking to a neighbor who lives right next to us, and he shared that, that day, they had just buried his brother, and he was grieving from that. And so in that conversation, I just felt the Lord as I was talking to him and, and expressing my compassion and condolences to him. And I'm like, yeah, God's with me. That, that's what's different. That's what's changed. We have the Lord with us wherever we go. And yet, sadly, so many of us don't realize, even if we realize, we forget the amazing privilege that we have, the old covenant believers would have given their left arm to have the access that we have, and yet we take it for granted. How many times do we get up in the morning and, and we say, okay, uh, I, I wanna spend some time with the Lord, but we get 
into something, we get busy with something, or maybe we oversleep, and all of a sudden we don't have time to spend with him. And, and we're like, oh, okay, I'll spend time with him later. And we get into our day, and, and so we're, we're going along through the day, and stuff hits us, and we kind of feel anxious about stuff because there's stuff going on. And, and in the middle of that anxiety, we don't take the cue to realize, oh, I need God, and so I, I can talk to him right now, or I, I, I could include him in what's going on, and, and so we try to fix it ourselves, or we just kind of, you know, do something to distract ourselves from that, and then we get home at night, and, and we have another opportunity, and, and we could spend some time with the Lord, but instead the TV remote's sitting there, and we just turn it on, and we binge out on something and watch TV. Like, so many ways we just whittle away the privilege that we have with the Lord. Now, it's not wrong to watch TV. It's not wrong to do other things. In fact, we can include God in all that because he's with us. But so many times we ignore. So many times we don't realize. So many times we don't take advantage of the ability to go into the most holy place. Relationally, physically he's already there, but relationally we ignore the Lord. We maybe even avoid the Lord instead of coming right to him, knowing that we've been cleansed by Christ, knowing that we have access, knowing that he's the one who satisfies fully. In fact, we just sang a little bit ago, Christ is enough for me. The world will not satisfy, but Christ, he's enough for me. All of my needs are met in him. We have that availability 24-7. We don't have to drive to church to get that, although this is where we come and gather. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. It's one of our lettuce points. You don't have to come here to meet the Lord. You come here to be with others and meet with the Lord. We can meet with the Lord anytime, anywhere. He's with us. God has torn open the veil through Christ, and we have access. Let us draw near to God. What does that look like for you? What is the Lord saying to you about that right now? Even just to understand the privilege again but even to take steps toward the Lord saying, oh God, I want to be with you as much as you have now said that you want to be with me. He's opened the way, a new and living way through Christ that we can be with him. Respond as God is leading you. What, what does he want you to do in these next hours or, or days of this week to draw near to God? Secondly, it tells us our next let us in verse 23. It says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Because we have access to God, as he says now, hold on to the hope that you profess. Hope is a great word, isn't it? We all need hope. Hope is what keeps us going forward. Hope is what helps us to see light at the end of a tunnel. Hope is what gives us the encouragement to keep going. Imagine that today, right now, we, we finished up the service and we pack up in a big bus, all of us, and we go over to North Mountain and we're going to hike up the mountain together. Are you all ready for that? Anybody want to go on the hike? Um, but it, it, we can't pick and choose. We all have to go. Everybody has to go. And so we're together, and, and we have to get from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. And so we get out of the bus. We have no supplies with us. We start hiking, and a little ways in, we start to realize, man, we didn't bring water. We didn't bring snacks. Uh, maybe someone has some, like, lifesavers or something, <laughs> a piece of gum. Uh, but we don't have enough for this journey up the mountain. And, and, and some are ready to just bound up to the top of the mountain. Others are straggling behind, and we're going, okay, how do we get everyone up this mountain? And halfway up, we start to get discouraged. People are falling off. People aren't able to get there. And Are we really going to be able to make it to the top of this mountain? We start to lose hope. When you start to lose hope, what decision might we make about this hike? We're just going to head back on down. We're, we're going to give up on this idea. We're going to go on back down. Hope is that key that, that says, I really think we can make this. I really think we can do this. We'll come back to that in a moment. This tells us not to lose hope, not to give up on hope, to hold on to it unswervingly. I love that NIV version of it, unswervingly. There's a word. Uh, other translations might say to hold fast without wavering. It's this idea of not wobbling to, to one side or the other, to, to hold resolutely 
on to the hope that we profess. We need to hold on to it. But, but how can we hold on? Are, are we really that strong in the, in the difficult moments of life where we can hold on to hope and we can just say, okay, I'm holding, Lord, I'm holding. I, I'll do this because I know that you're... There's only so much self-will we have to hold on. I love that this verse gives us some other reasons to have hope. First of all, it's coming out of the verses prior where it tells us the access that we have. And out of the time of presence with the Lord, as we've drawn near to the Lord, it always produces hope. Every time we spend quality time with God, we have hope. Isaiah 40 tells us that. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will walk and not grow weary. They will run and not grow faint. That's how we're going to get up that mountain. <laughs> we're waiting upon the Lord. We're, we're renewing our strength in him. And, and so that's one way we have hope is we've spent that time with him. We, we draw near to him. So when you see your hope meter dropping, don't forget, let us, number one, let us draw near to God and the access that we have to him. But it also tells us another reason right here in this verse. We hold on to this hope because he who promised is faithful. Oh, remember that this equation isn't just one direction. We don't just draw near to God. God draws near to us. He's made promises to us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He's made promises to us that he's more than enough for all of our needs. And if we remember our God who is faithful, then we have what we need. So back to that mountain. We're trying to climb up this mountain. We're trying to have the hope that we can get to the top. But we have a professional hiking guide who came along with us. His name is Jesus. And this professional hiking guide is, is along on the mountain. Guess what? He remembered to bring the water. He remembered to bring enough snacks for everybody. He knows the trail. He's already hiked the trail. He knows the way up to the top. And he's really strong. In fact, the people who can't get up to themselves, he's going to just go down and he's going to pick them up and carry them to the top. Because sometimes in life, that's what we need. Someone who will just carry us. He has everything that's needed for this journey. And he will get us where we need to go. Because he who promised is faithful. If you're discouraged in some way in this journey through life, if you're discouraged in this journey walking with the Lord, first of all, don't forget, draw near to God. But second of all, hold on to the hope that you have in Jesus. Remember he's with you today. Whatever you may be facing, whatever is, is in front of you that looks like this really hard obstacle, whatever he's called you to that's more than you could ever do in your own strength. Brett, where are you at? This job's more than you can do, brother. You, you can't do it on your own. And I'm saying this to Brett, but I'm saying it to every one of you, whatever God has called you to, it's more than you can do in your own strength. He doesn't want just you. He wants you to, he wants you to serve as the Holy Spirit is in you. With all the strength that he provides to labor and keep going forward. So keep looking to Jesus. Keep looking to Jesus. Whatever he's called you to, he who promised is faithful and he will get you there where you need to be. Let us hold on to hope. That's the second wedge. Let us falls apart. It doesn't stay together. We have a third let us. And it's found in verse 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Love and good deeds. Let us consider how to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. If you're paying attention, you just notice there's a big shift that happened in the passage. The first two lettuces have been about us connecting with the Lord, drawing near to him, holding on to hope in him. Now we're told to let us consider how to spur one another on. It's changed from this relationship with God to this relationship with others. And let me tell you that's in total keeping with what God does all the time in his word. In fact, think with me back to the great commandment. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Singular. He says, let me give you two. <laughs> the first is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah, you've heard that one, right? Love the Lord your God. But he gave him a two for one. What was the next one? Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, all the law and the prophets, everything, everything I've ever said hangs on those two commands. 
love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So here he's shifting this idea that based on the access that we have with God, let's keep doing this together. Let, let's help everyone move forward. Let's not let people drag behind. Let, let, let's keep together in this journey that we have. Let us do this for one another. It says, let us consider. This is a word that, that actually tells us to stop and think, to reason. Notice, is there anyone around me, is there anyone in my life who seems to need some spurring on toward love and good deeds? Is there anyone who seems like they might be kind of straggling away or someone who's struggling, someone who's falling behind, some, someone who's walking away? I need, to, I need to notice that. Stop and consider, it's telling us. And then it tells us that we should spur one another on toward love and good deeds. I love this idea of spurring. It's actually not a very positive kind of connotation. To spur someone on actually has the idea of kind of provoking them, like a spur in the side of a horse, uh, you know, poking a bear that's sleeping so that they wake up. Um, even, I'll tell you a story, two weeks ago we were with our Lisette's side of the family uh, down at the beach, and we were with them for a week, and we got to see our three-year-old niece, Kinsley. She's cute, she's got all kinds of energy, and at night she hits the pillow and she's, she's out, right? But all day long, it's like motor, 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 motor. And so I was playing some games with her, doing hide-and-seek and running all over the house, and she would hide first, I'd come find her, and she, she's like hiding under a blanket. You're like, where's Kinsley? I don't see her. And you're like... You're, but you got to act like you don't see her, and then and then I go and hide, and like I'm hiding in plain sight, and she just walks right by. So I'm like, okay, so you're playing with a three year old, okay, right? And one of the things that you do as an adult when you're tired of hide and seek is that you kind of sit down and you, you play like like you're tired, and so you're gonna fall asleep. And so I sat there and I went, you know, you're snoring, you're like, and they're like, wake up, wake up. But first they come, they tap you. But three year olds are relentless, aren't they? They will not let you sleep when you pretend to be sleeping. Actually, if you were really asleep, they still wouldn't let you sleep because they're making too much noise. Anyways, she comes up, and she's like, wake up, wake up. And she, like, smacks my face. And then she's, like, yelling in my ear, wake up. And I'm like, oh, and trying to, like, Ugh. And then she's poking me in the eye. Wake up. And I'm like, Ugh. and I wake up, and then she laughs and thinks it's great. And then now i got to do this all over again, and she's going to slap me in the face and poke me in the eye and everything. She will not let me sleep. And the Lord is telling us this, stop and consider. Let us consider how we might spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Is there somebody in your life who you need to have a phone call? Is there somebody in your life you need to text? Somebody in your life you need to take out to coffee or to lunch? Is there somebody in your life, maybe, maybe even here today, that you just need to talk afterwards and say, you know, hey, I've noticed, you know, like, are you, Maybe I've noticed you're discouraged. Are you doing okay? How can I pray for you? Or maybe somebody, you've noticed there's, there's an unhealthy pattern in life and lovingly, graciously, not like Kinsley poking in the eye. No one's allowed to bleed in these conversations. Lovingly, we might need to spur someone on back toward their relationship with the Lord. Maybe we need to invite someone to come with us on something so that it gets them active and involved or some way that we can help spur each other on. Because the Lord loves us too much to let people fall away. He's told the responsibility now to be in the body to help keep each other going forward. Kind of like on that mountain, not only do we have that professional guide, but we have one another to help each other. I get that picture. Maybe that guide does the carrying for some, but maybe we help team carry some others up the mountain, and we, and we, we do it together. So stop and consider right now. Is there someone that the Lord would put on your heart and your mind that you need to connect with this week? Maybe after church today, maybe sometime this week, to spur someone on toward love and good deeds. Last one, let us. Let us not give up on the habit of meeting together, but encourage one another as long or as the day is approaching, all the more as the day is approaching. The, the day, capital D, return of Christ. There's only so much time left, it's reminding us. So let's not give up on this habit of meeting together. Some of your, your translations may not have the word let us right there. They, 
technically in the Greek language, it doesn't use that re repetitive again, but it's implied in the way that it's said. So let us not give up on this habit of meeting together, but encourage one another as long as it's called today. This is a pastor's dream to have a verse like this. Let's just say it. Hey, folks, get to church. That's what it's saying. Well, kind of is what it's saying. Don't give up the habit of meeting together. We need each other. Not only be here on Sunday mornings, but be part of one another's lives. Get together in all the shapes and ways and forms that it takes. Don't give up on this. Implying that it's hard. Some others have fallen into this habit of not meeting together, but you guys stay in on this habit. I preached this verse in March of this year before we started this series in Hebrews. Does anybody remember? I took that verse Hebrews 10, 25, and I preached a whole message on this because it was so important at that time in the life of our church, we felt like we need a whole message on this. Today, I'm only making it the fourth point as we wrap up the sermon. But here we were in, in March. We were coming out of a very difficult season with COVID and, and another you know, big wave of it over the winter time. And, and uh, man, it was a long two years at that point. It was almost exactly at two years since COVID began for us. And, and it was a tough time. And COVID was, has been tough on people's individual life. It's been tough on the church. And it was this reminder, guys, let's pull back together. And thankfully, these last couple of months, we've had much less restrictions, much less, much less worries. And, and it's been really nice to, to be able to meet much more freely together. But I want to remind you of something. COVID is not going to be the only obstacle in our lives that would keep us from meeting together. You're going to have life. <laughs> You're going to have responsibilities. You're going to have things that you commit to that maybe aren't the greatest priorities. And you might get your priorities out of whack sometimes. You might get hurt in the church. You might have a church situation blow up. You might just get tired. You might just get dis discouraged in life. And this is telling us, don't give up on this habit. God has done something to redeem these people, to bring us into his presence and to call us to, to encourage one another. He's done all of that, and he's saying, don't walk away from what I've done. Don't go and be that solo Christian that just kind of drifts away, that just gets kind of, kind of disillusioned with, with church. I know it can happen. I know it's hard, but he says, make that journey back. Always make that journey back to be part of the family because we need each other. We got to encourage each other. We got to stay together. Because you know that awesome salvation we have. Life is long in between here. And to make it to that, that glorious day when Jesus comes back, we got to stay hanging together. Don't let your lamps go out. Keep the oil burning. Keep each other encouraged. And let's get there together. That's his encouragement to us. Let us not give up on this habit of meeting together. So what is the Lord saying to you about that? It's not just Sunday mornings, folks. I, in fact, I'll just put a little plug in here. This coming fall and in, in, in just a couple of weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna be bringing out to you guys a new initiative to, to re, rebuild our small groups in our church, to build more small groups in our church. And this is speaking to the young adults, to the older adults, uh, teenagers, you kind of already have, have your thing with small groups and, and youth group. Uh, but a new initiative to be pulling together Outside of just Sunday mornings, we have small groups, but we need more. And we want to pull, we want to encourage you to pull in toward these, to do life together. Because being known and knowing others is the way that we're going to do this. The way that we're going to be able to spur each other on. The way that we're going to encourage each other. And maybe you already have that community in other ways uh, with certain friendships, other, other smaller groups that you're part of. That's awesome. But we're going to be bringing this to you as, as another opportunity to, to, to pull in together. Don't give up on this habit of being together. So to conclude here on the screen, I'm going to have these four, uh, these four encouragements of the, the lettuce salad that's brought to us in, in Hebrews 10. I didn't make this up. This is the Lord. So this is cool. I get to talk about lettuce and salads in church. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold on to hope. Let us consider, and there's too much to put, how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together. Which of these is the Lord speaking to you most about right now? Think about it. Take a moment with you and the Lord, or maybe in each of these, is there a way that he's speaking to you? Let's take a moment with the Lord. If he's asking you to do something, just simply say yes and ask him to help you with it.
Remember, he's with you. You don't have to serve him alone. You don't have to take steps of faith alone. You do it with Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that the, the curtain has been torn wide open. We thank you that we have access to the most holy place. We, of all people, us, can have access because of the blood of Jesus right into the very dwelling place of you on earth. You're inside of us now. Lord, I pray for us that, that in each of these ways you've challenged us, each of these ways you're making it very practical that, that we would continue to hold on to Jesus. We continue to draw near. We continue to hold on to faith, our faith and hope in you. We can, can continue to spur one another on and we can continue to be together. Lord, build us up as your church family here, Emmanuel Church, that we would be faithful till that last day. We want to have that view in sight as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. Please come tonight, uh, 7 p.m. Our youth are going to be sharing about their their trip to the Life Conference, sharing stories and testimonies about what happened. So it's 7 o'clock tonight. We'll see you there. The Lord bless you.